In 2021, computer viruses have become commonplace. So much so that there are entire underground groups that deal with manufacturing and distributing these computer viruses in various forms. It is what we now commonly refer to as malware, a short for malicious software. The use of malware to steal, disrupt, destroy or ransom data is classified under cybercrime, an industry that costs the world trillions and trillions of dollars each year. It has been exactly 50 years since the discovery of the first ever computer virus. In just half a century, it has evolved to the point where it is one of the most dangerous threats facing organizations and governments around the world. A very significant threat to national security and peace between several nations. But when and where exactly did it all start? The theoretical concept of computer viruses, though it was not referred to as a computer virus at the time, was presented by Hungarian scientist and mathematician John von Neumann in a series of lectures titled The Theory and Organization of Complicated Automata, which he conducted in the University of Illinois in 1949. This was later published by the same university in 1966, titled The Theory of Self-Reproducing Automata. To put it as simply as possible, he essentially proposed that as computer programs develop, becoming more intricate and capable of emulating the human nervous system, it would at some point make sense if it were able to self-replicate or self-reproduce. This theory would first show some practical application in a game hosted by AT&T's Bell Labs in the 1960s, called Darwin, created by Viktor Alexander Vysotsky along with Robert Morris Sr. and Malcolm Douglas McElroy on an IBM 7090 mainframe. Each player would take turns loading a program, which were called organisms, written by the authors in assembly language into a specified section of the computer's memory. This section would be called the arena, and a separate program called the umpire would provide functions for the loaded programs to call. Once the players released the programs into the arena, the writers or players wouldn't have any control, and the programs would be left to do the work. The task of each of these programs were to probe each other's memory locations, essentially taking over the opposing programs. The last program left alive would be declared the victor, or the game would end after a set amount of time. Although this was the first practical implementation of a self-replicating program, as described by John von Neumann, malicious use of it was not practiced, nor even mentioned for that matter. However, in 1970, a science fiction short story by Gregory Benford called The Scarred Man would describe a computer program named Virus, behaving eerily similar to the computer viruses we know today, and a vaccine which could stop the virus, much like antivirus softwares. Keep in mind this was before the concept of self-replicating programs were popular and much before the term computer virus was even coined. The author, who was previously involved in programming computers, was inspired when he realized that bad code was included in certain programs that threw things awry, and postulated that this could be done intentionally he proceeded to test a few lines of code within Lawrence Radiation Laboratory, where he worked, using the programming language Fortran, and successfully managed to propagate certain code within other programs. This was in 1969 during the first phases of the ARPANET, essentially the first internet, a predecessor to what we now know as WWW, World Wide Web. Essentially, Benford would, without his knowledge, have unofficially written the first ever computer virus, and a year later published The Scarred Man. In this story, the protagonist would input the virus into a computer with dialing capabilities. It would then dial continuously and attempt to reach another such computer, hanging up on any humans that answer. It would then program the computer it reached with the same virus, until it too starts dialing random numbers and doing the same. The protagonist would then offer to help fix the program for the victims by providing the vaccine, much like how ransomwares operate today. A year later, what is now officially regarded as the first computer virus would be born, albeit for demonstration and not malicious purposes. It was called the Creeper, the name inspired by the green-skinned zombie from the Scooby-Doo cartoon, and it was created by Bob Thomas from BBN Technologies, a company that played a significant role in the development of ARPANET. Creeper was an experimental, self-reproducing program written in PDP-10 assembly language and was designed to infect the PDP-10 computers, running a 10x operating system on the ARPANET at Digital Equipment Corporation, or DEC. When a 10x computer was infected with the Creeper, it would print on teletype machines, I'm the Creeper, catch me if you can. It would then move along in the network till it found another 10x computer and did the same. And this process would continue. 
Ray Tomlinson, a colleague of Bob Thomas, would create an upgraded version of the Creeper, where not only did it move across multiple computers but also replicated itself and kept a copy of it in the infected computer before moving along, much like how a computer worm behaves today. It would not damage any files, just simply displayed the message. An annoyance for sure, but not destructive in any way. Ray Tomlinson would also go on to create Reaper that same year, a program that behaved similar to the Creeper, moving across computers, replicating itself, but instead of displaying anything, it would search for copies of the Creeper and delete it, becoming the first antivirus solution, though it behaved more like a virus. Creeper was contained within BBN technologies and never really made it outside the extended networks. In 1974, three years later, the rabbit, pronounced as Wabbit, virus would first make an appearance. It would be contained within one single device. The program or file would just essentially duplicate itself until the system crashes. The system that was first running this virus would be an IBM OS 360 mainframe. This account comes from a man named Bill Kennedy who described how his co-worker would write this script that essentially replicated itself multiple times till it consumed all system resources and crashed the machine. This employee would soon be fired after for creating the program. If you're someone who's acquainted with IT security, you'd recognize that this is very similar to what we call a denial of service attack, where a website or a system would be flooded with some kind of traffic to overload it and run it offline. In fact, this was more of what is called a fork bomb rather than a virus, a type of a denial of service attack which causes resource starvation by continuous replication. The name rabbit meant to relate to the rate at which rabbits reproduce. Although this folk bomb was damaging, it was still not intended to be used maliciously, at least as far as we know. One major downside to the folk bomb was that it had to be deployed manually onto systems rather than automatically moving across the network. Although the term computer virus still hadn't officially been coined yet, the term Trojan horse, a type of malware we're familiar with today, would be coined in a 1974 Multics security evaluation report by the US Air Force, describing it as a hypothetical possibility. For those of you who don't know what a Trojan horse or Trojan is, it's essentially a type of malware that enters your computer, pretending to be legitimate software, but is something else entirely. The name is inspired from the mythical ending to the decade-long Trojan War described in the epic Aeneid by the Roman poet Virgil when the Achaeans or Greeks entered the city of Troy by tricking them into accepting a large wooden horse. Unbeknownst to the Trojans, the horse would be filled with Greek soldiers, who would sneak out in the middle of the night and destroy the city of Troy, bringing victory to the Achaeans. And so the term Trojan came to describe anything that gained access into a secure environment by means of deception. In 1975, a year after Trojan horse was coined as a hypothetical possibility, John Walker, a computer programmer, wrote a program called Animal, using the UNIVAC assembly language. Essentially, on the exterior, it was just a game that asked users 20 questions, in order to determine what animal they were thinking of. If the program guessed wrong, it would take suggestions from the user to help distinguish the specific animal in the future, and even contain the capability to determine if the user was intentionally trying to mislead the program. All the while in the background, it used the program Pervade, another piece of code written by John Walker, which copied the animal game into every single directory that the victim had access to. The reason that animal was considered a Trojan horse is because it never disclosed its true intentions, which was to propagate itself. As stated in John Walker's blog, this is how it spread. If the infected user was sharing any directories with other users, then when those users find and run the game, it copies itself to every directory that they have access to as well. Eventually, once a privileged user who has access to system protected directories runs the file, it'll copy itself into the system library, thus making it available to every single user in the network. The program eventually made its way across the United States, but it was very careful not to damage any existing files or clog up storage in the user's computer. Once again, this was a non-malicious piece of malware. However, John Walker states that this program was viewed with benign amusement by the managers of the systems it infected, and stated that they missed the point. What if his intentions were not so pure? What if Animal was intended to be malicious instead? Fast forward seven years, in 1982, the Elk cloner would appear. This would mark the first virus to have left the confines of where it was created, 
and also was given the title of the first ever personal computer virus. Richard Skrenta, at the time a 15-year-old high school student at Mount Lebanon High School, Pennsylvania, often played pranks on his friends. He would give his friends at his computer club pirated copies of games in the form of floppy disks. It was quite popular back then to swap floppy disks with pirated content in them. When the floppy was booted up a specific number of times, the game would just stop working and display a humorous message. After a while, Skrenta's friends stopped letting him near any of their disks. This was when he decided that he needed to find a way to do what he was doing without having to input the code into every individual floppy disk. One winter, in the span of two weeks, Skrenta wrote the first ever boot sector virus, the Elk Cloner. Skrenta could input his own infected floppy into a machine and the Elk Cloner would copy itself into the memory of his school computer. It would then run in the background, and whenever it detected a new floppy inserted into the machine, possibly by another person, it would modify the files and infect that disk as well, while still remaining in the initial floppy disk and the computer it infected. Although simple, this was extremely efficient in how fast it could spread. No serious harm was intended to be done using the Elk Cloner. All Skrenta did was attach the virus into a game in the floppy, and the 50th time that the game was booted, instead of running the game, it would display this small pawn. It's not known how many computers exactly were infected by the virus. However, it did gain the title of the first ever virus to cause a massive outbreak, still with non-malicious intent. In November of 1983, about a year after the Elk Cloner, Fred Cohen, who was a graduate student at the University of South California at the time, came up with an idea while attending Professor Len Adelman's class. You may know Professor Adelman as one of the creators of the RSA encryption algorithm, the widely used public key crypto system. Cohen brought his idea to Adelman, describing how he'd like to create a program and make it publicly available to all users in the university system. The program would be advertised to be doing something useful, but once a user clicked on it, the user's computer would surrender all control of its rights, data, and privileges to Cohen. Adelman sought permission from the university to conduct Cohen's research, and once obtained and performed, it proved to be a success and worked exactly as Cohen had planned. Cohen's program worked by means of replication. He loaded his program into a floppy disk and inserted it into a computer. It made copies of itself and then moved from one computer to another, eventually seizing control of an entire network of systems. Adelman, who was at the time researching HIV in a molecular biology lab, likened the way the program behaved to a biological virus, and eventually started calling these programs viruses. Cohen would proceed to demonstrate this virus in a computer security seminar on a VAX 11750 running the Unix operating system. He demonstrated five instances, and in all cases, the virus was able to take control of the system, the first demonstration being the fastest, in just five minutes, and the average time in all other demonstrations being 30 minutes. In 1984, a year later, Cohen would go on to publish a paper named Computer Viruses, Theory and Experiments. It is at this time the word computer virus was officially coined. It's important to note that both Cohen and Adelman had no idea about previous instances of computer viruses, such as the Elk Cloner or the Creeper. Playing a part was the lack of an actual worldwide internet and the term virus not having been used to describe these programs before. However, there is no doubt that Fred Cohen and Professor Len Adelman's research, experiments, and demonstrations helped bring awareness to the computer virus and serves as the reason as to why the word virus is attributed to such malicious programs today. A couple years later, in 1986, Basit Farooq Alvi and Amjad Farooq Alvi Two brothers based in Lahore, Pakistan, who ran a computer store named Brain Computer Services, selling software, wanted to get back at users who were using pirated copies of a hot monitoring software that they had developed. Particularly, they were quite annoyed at American University students, where this software was gaining popularity. Perhaps what's quite funny about this is that the brothers were in fact selling pirated copies of foreign software, such as Lotus123 and WordStar at the time in their store. They decided to infect these copies of their softwares as well as the foreign softwares with what is now called the brain virus, also known as the Pakistani flu, and sold it to foreign tourists in floppy disks. It was a type of boot sector virus and is regarded as the first virus that infected the IBM personal computer running MS-DOS. Infected floppy disks with illegal software would find that the name of the disk label was a copyright symbol following the word brain. It also utilized between 3 to 7 kilobytes of storage space in the floppy disk but never really affected the hard disk. Infected floppies would be slightly slower, an unintended effect of the virus. It would also come with the message which could be read with the use of a binary editor. The message started with, Welcome to the dungeon, and contained the name of the two brothers, along with their store name as well as the address. 
and finally provided their contact details in case the infected users required a vaccination. According to the brothers that created the virus, it was not meant to be harmful in any way and was more of a friendly virus that was made to bring attention to the fact that the user was utilizing a pirated software. However, damaging variants of the brain virus would start to surface after the initial release, possibly modified by experienced programmers. Although the brothers didn't expect much attention from doing what they had done, their phones started to go off. Calls started coming in from the US, the UK, with hundreds of users furiously demanding that they remove the virus. The brothers would of course go on to explain that the virus was not malicious though it is reported that some users did experience data loss and other issues, which could potentially have been the work of other variants of the brain virus which were modified to do so. Brain was also the world's first stealth virus, as it had certain stealth capabilities. Whenever infected boot sectors were accessed, the program, which could be an antivirus program, would be directed to the original boot sector instead. One of the most interesting pieces of trivia about the impact of this virus is possibly the fact that John McAfee, the founder of the global security software company famous for antivirus softwares, was inspired to create his first antivirus software, Viruscan, when he found that his own computer had been infected with Brain. It is possible that this was a variant of Brain and not the original, as McAfee states that the virus erased his work files from his computer hard drive. Brain Computer Services is now known as Brain Telecommunication Limited, one of Pakistan's biggest internet service providers. The earliest virus that I could find which was intended to cause damage and successfully did so was the PC Write Trojan, released the same year as Brain. PC Write was a legitimate word processor developed by Quicksoft. However, PC Write version 2.72 was not, as Quicksoft never released such a version. Those that downloaded and ran PC Write version 2.72 found that their hard drive was completely formatted and their file allocation table wiped out. It was just purely destructive and uninteresting and you probably won't find much about it online for these reasons. It is however sometimes referred to as the first ever Trojan horse virus by those that refused to acknowledge Animal by John Walker to hold that position. It wasn't until 1987 that computer viruses started to become somewhat popular and began to command worldwide attention. Large scale and destructive viruses such as the Morris worm, the AIDS Trojan, the Michelangelo, I love you and many many more came soon after. We'll discuss this in detail on the next part of the series, The Evolution of the Computer Virus. Stay tuned to the TWS channel and thank you so much for watching.